Our scripture for this morning, as you know, we've been following the final words of Christ on the cross. And we are still in John's Gospel, and I'm in the 19th chapter. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved, John, standing nearby, he said to his mother, Dear woman, here is your son. He was in reference to John. And to his disciple John, he said, Here is your mother. And from that time on, this disciple took her into his home. May God truly bless the reading of Jesus Christ's words. The world is not always willing, but God's will is to save the world and as many people possible in it. That's the theme behind every one of our sermons in this new sermon series. The world is not always willing, but God's will is to save the world his created universe, and as many people as possible. At some point, we will need to ask this question. What can we learn from Jesus about the will of God? If he is our Lord and our Savior, we want to know what he understood the will of God to be and how he tried to live it out in his own life. Perhaps there's no better place to begin than with the prayer that Jesus gave to his disciples and to us, the Lord's Prayer. When you think about it, this prayer is focused simplicity at its best. This brief prayer, depending upon which English translation you use, is some 50 to 70 words, includes a petition that the will of God be done in our world. This petition about God's will is the first of four petitions in the prayer itself. Before our prayer for daily bread, before our prayer for forgiveness, before our request to be protected from evil, comes this petition. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now really, this emphasis should not surprise us. Jesus began his ministry by announcing that the kingdom of God has come near. His Sermon on the Mount is a description of the quality of life that will mark this very kingdom. No wonder, then, that the petition for God's kingdom would lead the way in Jesus' prayer. Whatever else we pray for each day, whatever else we seek to bring to pass, this is the beginning, that God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thy will be done. This is the most frightening of prayers and the most reassuring at the same time. It's frightening because if we really mean it, thy will be done, we're giving up control. You ever sign a check and then hand it to another person? You don't do that very often, do you? You really have to know that other person. Because they're going to fill it out according to what they're going to do. That's what you do with God when you say, Thy will be done. I, Barry, give up control. All I'm doing on this check is signing my name. God, you fill in the rest. That's what it's like. And that's frightening. It's not that we have to be control freaks. It's just that there are certain things we like to be in charge of. That's normal. But when we pray, thy will be done, what we're saying at the same time is, 
Raymond's will not be done ahead of God's will. Or Larry's will not be done before God's will is complete. Or Greg's will not be done at all until God's will is completed. That's what that means. And that's a frightening part of prayer. But it's also the most reassuring. How could we be safer in this universe than if God's in control? <laughs> that's the other half of the coin. It's frightening and it's reassuring as well. Why should we pray for the will of God? If something is the will of God, will it not come to pass if we don't pray for it? If it is God's will, does God need our help? Even a reminder of what that will is if it's going to come about? When we pray, several things can begin to happen. For one, our own sensitivity to that particular thing is heightened, heightened. We might see how we can contribute to the solution as we pray about something. We might come to a better understanding of what that thing might be. These changes within the person who is praying may well help bring that part of God's will into play. So there's something more. When we pray, your will be done, we become agents of change in bringing the will of God to pass. We're agents of change. I remember a course back in seminary. I forget the name of the course, but we read one book, and that was very unusual, very unusual. And it wasn't even a big book. And the title of that book was Agents of Change. And what the professor was trying to impress upon us and just beat us over the head all semester long was, as ministers, you are agents of change. That's why there was only one book. You are agents of change when you are truly in lockstep step with God's will. Because when God's will is being enacted, something is being altered. Something is being changed. You are agents of change. There is much in our world that is opposed to the will of God. Some of it is obvious to us when we see it. Some of it may not be so obvious. But that which opposes the will of God will always be united in strength. And it will exert its desire and its power upon those who want God's will to prevail. To pray for God's will is to put yourself in stark opposition to an unwilling world. Let's be honest with each other. Not all aspects of American culture promote God's will. Like, I needed to tell you that this morning. <laughs> we all know that. There is materialism. What matters most is money and possessions. Materialists measure their success by wealth and by the things that they acquire. There is hedonism. Whatever feels good must be right. Pleasure becomes the ultimate goal. These people want to be comfortable and they want to pursue fun and they will not accept somebody else's code of morals. There is individualism. America was built on the backs of rugged individualists. People who worked hard to achieve the American dream. But today, that has...
has been replaced by a culture of narcissism. What used to be the motto, I want to make something out of my life, has now been replaced with the motto, what are you going to give me so I get what I want? Boy, what a change has taken place. There is idealism. Ideals are the things that people have sometimes instead of God. And they believe everyone else should have the same set of ideals as they do. Ideals replace God and they aren't shy about replacing any part of God's will. Idealism won't negotiate, won't compromise, won't bend an inch, except their own ideals. When you see someone who will not negotiate or compromise, you are dealing with idealism. Their ideals are more important than working on something together. Materialism, hedonism, individual narcissism, idealism plague America today. It's in our culture. Turn on the television. You will see all four of these in the same night on shows and in the news. And here's the thing. If you stand up to confront the dishonesty of these four contortions of our culture, not only will you be met with united resistance, you will also be accused of being the problem. And that's the same thing that Jesus was confronted with in his three years of ministry. I am never in so much trouble as a minister as when I try to confront one of those four contortions of American culture today. They can even be people within my own congregation and before the end of the day, I'm not just disliked, I am hated. That's what we've come to. In this nation. The will of God has its adversaries. And you and I need to know that because if we're going to follow the teachings of Jesus Christ, the will of God, it will come to us at a cost. It's expensive. In the words of the great theologian Karl Barth, play close, close attention to his words here. To clasp the hands in prayer is the beginning of an uprising against the disorder of the world. Isn't that wonderful and accurate and true? So what's the upside to pray thy will be done? There is Kingdomism. Yep, I made that up. <laughs> you won't find that one in the dictionary. Ministers do this all the time. But the way I define kingdomism is acceptable all across Christianity. Kingdomism is the acceptance of that God knows what he is doing, and in particular, God knows what he is doing in my life. Adam, in the video, did such a splendid job helping us understand what Jesus' words meant. Woman, behold your son. Son, behold your woman, your mother. It was Jesus' wish that John, his disciple, would care for his mother and that his mother would care for John. It's worth noting the last verse of this little text that I read for you. Here's the last verse again. And from that day on, John took her 
to his house. Kingdomism helps us find meaning and purpose in being our brother and sister's keeper. That's what we're doing with no more malaria, isn't it? We're not going to see the people halfway around the world who will benefit from these nets that we are purchasing for them. We won't see them, but yet they are our brothers and sisters. And you're literally putting a protection of cover over children for the most part in the areas where they sleep so that the mosquitoes can't bite them in the middle of the night. We are our brothers and sisters keeper. Kingdomism means that you will place all points of view secondary to that of God's. That's hard to do. <laughs> I struggle with that. Doggone it, I have some ideas every once in a while, and I'd like to pursue those ideas. And some of those ideas are pretty good ideas, and that's all the more reason I want to pursue those ideas. And then God comes along and helps me realize there's a better way. And sometimes it's in direct opposition of my great idea. All points of view are secondary to God's point of view. It's not what others want. It's not what you might even prefer. It's what God wills for us that counts. Old blue eyes. Do you know who I'm talking about? Frank Sinatra. Years ago, he sang a song that we all love, and it had this lyric in it. I did it my way. Remember that? Robert sang that lyric. I did it my way. There you go. <laughs> Boy, old Snatcher could sing and he could act too. But kingdomism means that we do it God's way. That's what that means. Materialism won't work in the end because we are created for something more, something greater than just the mere acquisition of things. I've struggled with that one. Hedonism won't work in the end because happiness is a byproduct of living a spiritual life. It is not the targeted goal of a selfish life. Individual narcissism won't work in the end because God didn't create us just to live for ourselves. And idealism won't work in the end because idealism attempts to place more importance upon itself and its own ideals than it does the thoughts of someone else, including God's thoughts. Kingdomism means that you get to have a clean heart and a clear head when you go to bed at night. The forces that oppose God's will consort and conspire to build the case against God and against you. What kind of peace of heart and mind can that bring to someone in their bed? Kingdomism means that you may not always like certain people for the things that they do, but that you will try to love them even if you don't like them. You get to set aside race, creed, gender, age, and see all people as being God's child. Even if they don't want to see themselves that way, you get to see them that way. And it also means that you become more attuned to the good that is in another person 
that without God's help, you wouldn't see. About a month and a half ago, I gave a sermon on the ultimate will of God. Kind of had to deal with the same subject, Robert, as your song. The ultimate will of God is Jesus comes back to earth and establishes heaven on earth. His full kingdom come. That's the ultimate will of God. But what is God's greatest will? It's this. That Jesus might be your Savior. Your source of hope. Your doorway to a house of blessings. Your path to a life that stands up for what is true. Your map to find just who you were meant to be. That's God's greatest will for you. Jesus is perhaps best when he speaks about the kingdom. It's like finding valuable treasure in a field, he says, or a jewel worth a king's ransom. It's like finding something that you hated to lose and thought you'd never find again, an old keepsake, a stray sheep, a prodigal child. When you find yourself in God's kingdom, it's as if the thing you lost and thought you'd never find